Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to this very special edition of Transport in the Time of COVID-19. This is the Active Travel Fund Phase 2 Allocation Special. Uh, but it's so special, we're actually going to leave the uh, uh, Active Travel Fund Phase 2 Allocations to the end of it, and we're going to do the normal stuff first. Uh, because a lot has happened, particularly one particular report by PACT. Glad to see David Davis with us today. And uh, so a lot of non-active travel van stuff. Uh, do listen and we'll get on to that at the end. That's going to make it easier for various people uh, like Mark and others to comment uh, while it's still more fresh in the memory. Anyway, so uh, as usual, do email me if you want any links or slides. There's one particular page, which is something you're going to have to keep for reference. Uh, also, as so many do, to send me information. And uh, here we go. This is the thing we're going to talk about later. That's the tweet from Gart chaps unfortunately saying i just go out grab the helmet and off you go uh anyway we're going to be talking about that later uh usual format uh, apart from doing the active travel fund towards the end after everything right now this is your must read what kills most on the roads the new analysis for the new transport agenda uh by uh pacts uh, I've called it who or what kills whom because you may have read a piece uh, by me recently um, on the RDRF website called Who Kills Whom. But it's basically still talking about the same thing. It's how we measure uh, what's happening in road crashes and in, in this case, ones resulting in death. Uh, that's the link. Do look at it. It does make a uh, break with the way uh, 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 traditional road safety measures what it thinks the problem is. And here's a nice quote about me. Dr. Robert Davis and others have long sought to distinguish those activities which are hazardous, risking death, injury to the user, from those which are dangerous, risking dangers to others. Uh, risking danger to others. They argue that the thrust of policy should be to reduce danger at source. Um, so I'm in there and I'm glad to see that some of the phrases I suggested to David have appeared as well in the text. It's about how you measure danger on the road and it's making a step uh, to try and do that by looking at what happens uh by people rather than to people and i'll suggest to brian that we have a special on this uh on another occasion fairly soon uh about the metrics used okay so uh in addition uh here's uh something on the media reporting guidelines by laura laker and martin porter relating to the Active Travel Academy document, which you should have responded to. The consultation on that is now over. Uh, there's Chart Institute Highways and Transportation response to planning for the future. Um, something from Avon and Somerset Police about what they're trying to do, which is quite good. Uh, publication by the active nation commissioner in scotland that's the wonderful lee craigie do read that for scots and others a uh, short article of on police in waltham forest and newham getting bicycles uh, i mentioned that last week comment by scott urban who's been doing some modeling about uh, ltns and a reduction in car ownership Right, a couple of big ones from Cycling UK. Uh, first of all, some neatly written out stuff um, debunking the hate mails rubbish about how LTNs and cycle lanes slow the emergency services down. And they've also done a video on cycle lane myths there. 
also there's a big ones report that's come up by the walking and cycling alliance on the urgent case for more walking and cycling another one for your files to use as evidence in campaigning um there's been this article which i mentioned last week about people suggesting they're going to use their cars more after covid and I mention it because as uh, a little thread by Dr. Greg Marsden uh, querying if car use is back to normal. So have a look at that. Um, and here's an article in the planner saying we're concerned that the planning white paper could lock in a future of car based sprawl around major road construction. So uh, that's all about the planning white paper and you have to do your response to the consultation for that. Uh, uh, some nice articles online by John Dales on communications and LTNs. Uh, there is a webinar in Run From Exeter about uh, getting community streets, LTNs, etc. Um, done, that's one for campaigners. And also on Thursday, LCC are running a webinar on the climate emergency and transport. So there's quite a bit. Um, here's your victim blaming for tonight, Greater Manchester Police. I like, I noticed this one. Stay alert, vehicles may take more time to react. Well, they're going to take infinity because they're vehicles. Yes, not the people driving them. Anyway, I do put these up because uh, what's really nice to see with the victim blaming is that loads and loads of people pile on on Twitter. And um, that's actually quite refreshing and makes me feel good about myself. Um, and uh, here's the diversity page. Uh, one new thing, there's a Women of Colour Cycling Group UK who have that, that Twitter handle uh so uh you can follow them right on the ground in the uk portsmouth uh cycle lane trial uh bollards are being removed this appears to be a deliberate act this is council speaking um so that's portsmouth nottingham now Nottingham seem to have done reasonably well in terms of allocation, but you may remember this, the pictures, photos I showed you a few weeks ago, where there's a lot of advisory lines which are in orange for some reason. And uh, the Nottingham people say, all in all, many of these schemes are just unprotected painted lanes. Uh, so they're a bit concerned about that. I just want to keep your eye on. Uh, and school streets outside London. I'm mentioning a report on school streets in London, but Martin Key of Bridge Cycling says, reminder that the rest of the count county, county, that should be country, can't do them as we don't yet have the powers to enforce. That's something we're going to come back to. Uh, Newcastle, here's a nice little piece about how the um, closing to motor traffic of Salters Bridge uh, has made it a lot nicer for someone's daughter uh, and the effect it's made on her. Uh, Manchester City Council, Levens Hume, some seriously bagged footway parking there in the back you can see these that's not where you should be putting bollards. They do make the footway a lot narrower. Um, so I'm not quite sure how that should be dealt with, but maybe somebody can tell us. Uh, now in London, uh, here's your must read brief article on um, the uh, bailout of DFT until the mayoral elections and associated issues. Um, there's a update on school streets in London and that shows there are 383 plus 68 planned from 81 in April. So we're talking about you know just over 10 percent um, and also 
only 24 are secondary. Uh, and you may remember uh, Lucy Master and Taussig's article, uh, which is shortlisted for an Active Travel Awards, uh, uh, Active Travel Academy Media Awards uh, uh, prize because she talks about the need to cater for uh, people going to secondary schools. Um, now, this is in The Guardian today. Uh, there are three new lo low traffic neighborhoods put forward to the council yet to be approved. And the interesting thing about them is they're financed by an NHS trust charity. And uh, a lot of people have been saying, well, that's good because it shows the health link links between LTNs and good health. Others have been pointing out that, well, uh, it sh the funding shouldn't come from the charity, uh, let alone a health charity, it should come, ideally it would be coming straight from motorists who caused the problem in the first place, and if not from public money, rather than having to rely on charity. Uh, and there's a little video there about people trying to get some school streets in, um, uh, in Barking and Dagenham. Uh, this is a tweet about Camden, Steel Village saying, alarming news for all the traders on Haverstock Hill. Camden Council have approved cycling cycle lanes. This will kill the businesses. Uh, all parking will be removed and there will be no collections and deliveries because they'll be impossible. And they haven't quite got into saying it's North Korea yet, but they're sort of heading in that direction. Um, Hackney, yeah, I, I found this, I think, from Councillor Joe Rigby, uh, 10 school streets in Hackney, uh, and surveys, I haven't got a link, but the first forward resulted in average traffic reduction, I think they mean motor traffic, reduced by 68%, increase of about a half by children cycling school, and vehicle emissions uh, down by that amount. Um, be nice to have the link, I did ask her. Uh, Hounslow, Chiswick, yes, this was seen in an LTN in Chiswick. Uh, there's a, somebody's put that up on the side wall of their home and it reads, air pollution shortens your life, reduce traffic, support your LTN, yes. And Hackney again, this is a really nice uh, video on Twitter um, with uh, Sergeant Higgins explaining why he supports the school street and how the filter doesn't affect his ability to respond to emergencies. So, you know, do take a look at that. Um, and uh, it's, it's really the kind of social media use which we want to see from the police and emergency services it can be useful for educational purposes. Um, so that's good. Westminster, uh, the Hyde Park low traffic neighborhood, which I mentioned last week has been dropped. And there's a comment from uh, Fitzrovia's activist Linus Rees, uh, saying it was a very good scheme, uh, was backed up with research and analysis uh, but Westminster have, have backed off. In Lambeth, there's a response from LAS, that's London Ambulance Service, uh, saying that we do not anticipate any significant impact uh, from the filters. Um, okay, so a lot of this is all going to depend on them being operated by cameras and so on, but it's good to see those uh, um, things from the 999 services saying that they like LTN cycle lanes, etc. And there's your things to read as usual. I won't linger over them. Uh, just please sign that hit and run petition. Um, it's, it's not about being vindictive. It's about uh, taking away the incentive to leave the scene of a road crash where somebody's been hurt or even killed. There's a new consultation on longer lorry trailers for you and also one on legally binding UK air quality targets. And your uh, 
a bit low on the old car adverts. So here's one from the late 70s and 80s, which does have a car in it. And it's a bit of uh, late 70s, early 80s feminism. Uh, the ad was for the Fiat Palio. If it were a lady, it would get its bottom pinched. And this was, if this lady was a car, she'd run you down. So a bit of feminism there. And we're on to the Active Travel Fund, which uh, the, the allocation and guidance came out on Friday the 13th. Uh, so will this be a turning point for transport in England? We hope so. Right, that's the document to go to, right? Uh, it's not emergency active travel fund anymore, it's active travel fund. And this was now, it's not called tranche two, it's phase two. It does not replace the original network management duty guidance, uh, which was updated uh, in May this year because of COVID, uh, but provides additional advice on techniques for managing roads to deal with COVID-19 response related issues. Um, so I'll give you some of my personal takeaways. Um, there's the Shaps forward. Uh, the government therefore expects, note that road, expects local authorities to make significant changes to their road layouts to give more space to cyclists and pedestrians. Um, okay, you've heard a lot about consultation. Measures should be, it says, measures should be taken as swiftly as possible, but not at the expense of consulting local communities. Uh, there should be a step change in the, in the measures in their rollout is needed to maintain a green recovery. So calling for step change. Um, temporarily widened footways may no longer be needed. Uh, and changes junction designed to accommodate more cyclists like low level uh, cycle signals will be uh, available. Uh, and authorities should monitor and evaluate any temporary measures they install with a view to making them permanent and in embedding. Again, here's this forceful language. I think it's important to focus on language and embedding a long-term shift to active travel as we move from restart to recovery. Uh, also, the time scale is extended. Uh, the funding should be should as far as possible be committed by the end of the current financial year and schemes delivered as soon as reasonably possible thereafter. In contrast to transform funding, it's more important that the schemes are delivered robustly, community support established. Uh, so not rushing. Um, if uh, you're thinking about the time scale for a hard pressed authority now, with a lot of consultation. In fact, it's not too far away to talk about the end of the financial year. Uh, although I personally would say that if a council had been doing what it should have been doing since May, it should, uh, given the consultation requirements, still be able to get stuff in. So I'm slightly concerned about uh, stuff being kicked down the road, but my, that may just be me. Um, so here are the actual um, uh, allocations and this slide is the one that you really need to keep uh, because it's got all the links. There's that link there and there's another one which someone produced uh, on the day. Uh, someone's done a multiplier showing how much um, the uh, allocations have increased. Uh, don't forget four times as much overall is being given uh, uh, minus the five million pounds which seems to have gone mi missing. Um, percentages of bid, Laura Lake has done something and Adam Reynolds uh, who can't uh, be with us this afternoon uh, has done a full analysis on a very big spreadsheet saying you can see those council that had an oh shit moment when they didn't get their full tranche one allocation and those that went oh, to hell with it. 
also those that thought, oh, it's okay, so just let it loose. That's his uh, analysis of why the proportions are as they are, you may disagree. Um, I did the summary at three o'clock in the morning of the Friday. You may wish to look at that thread. Um, now, uh, Peter Walker's got an article in The Guardian, uh, which debunks that the benefit is uh, for wealthy people only. And that refers to Rachel Aldred's research. And that is a must read, must use. Do keep that in your files. Uh, Chris Boardman did a piece on the day saying, uh, you know, we, we, we must have um, kids able to move around low traffic neighborhoods with a nice picture of him playing out as a kid. Um, there's a public opinion survey which supports uh, everything DFT is doing that came out on the day. It's there. Public attitudes are in support. Always mention that when the press get a hold of you and say, oh, everybody's against it. No, they're not. Um, and uh, here's the Cycling UK take. So there's a lot there. This is what you need to read and you need to have it to keep uh, uh, there for your campaigning and professional work in this area. Don't forget there may be, we hope, phase three, phase four, phase five allocations. Um, that's what we're campaigning for. So do keep all this uh, read and inwardly digest. Right, here's a graph from Mark, which you might want to take us through. Uh, basically looking at the ones getting 100% of their funding. I think the London, he's got 130%, was actually only 100%. Um, Greater Manchester did very well. And here's a few of the others getting up towards around 100%. Um, more of interest is the one getting less and way down. Well, we can't see the slide. Ah, okay. Yeah. Can, there's a delay on the slides, by the way. All oh, right. Well, there's the 100%. There's the less than 100%. Can you see that? Yeah, you're all right now. Yeah. And uh, you can see, no big surprise, the Worcestershire's uh, down there, uh, Central Bedfordshire. Um, uh, it's not the, the, the most interesting is the final slide I'm going to show after the next one. Um, but that's just an indicator of the ones that didn't do well. Uh, there was some good press coverage uh, on the Worcestershire one. Um, nice to see some good local journalism there. Uh, them talking about their, you know, their lack of success. Uh, that's good. Uh, and also what was interesting is that the guy they interviewed from the cycling groups said, we want cycling and walking groups to be consulted. So when we get onto this consultation issue, don't forget that should include cycling and walking groups. A Guardian editorial on uh, why low traffic neighborhoods are a good thing. And there's the video put up by the Shoreham people, because as you know from last week, their lane was taken out. They've been very active in pushing for it, giving evidence. Um, and uh, so there's some good media stuff there. There's Mark's final graphic. Uh, it was showing the awards in terms of money per person over five pounds. Um, so the big winner there is Brighton and Hove. Uh, Reading done well, Nottingham's done well, uh, despite those concerns that I mentioned earlier that the local activists had about orange paint. Uh, South End seems to have done well. Um, Greater Manchester, yeah, they got a lot of money. Uh, London isn't there because London's got, uh, what, about 20 million and uh, plus the original amount. And don't forget, there are about 8 million people living in London and actually about 10 million on any given day with commuters. Um, 
so and Surrey uh, seems to have done not too badly. So uh, uh, there you go, because you would have noticed from previous slide that Slough was below 100%, but it's done not too bad in terms of the numbers of people who live there. Okay, so this is a point. Here's a written answer to a question on part six of the Road Traffic Act 2004. And the sp spokesman for the department said, discussions with key stakeholders have started um, and it is not possible at this stage to say when the powers will be available to local authorities. And it would be nice to have some comments from people on how important this is for school streets uh, enforcing various uh, kinds of things to do with parking and uh, just how important you think it is for people outside London to get that sorted. So I normally put up a delay slide and I'm now renaming it the where we are now after Friday the 13th slide. <laughs> And this is my summary of where we are. Okay, so this is my view. Government commitment from May continues, although it's late. It should have been the beginning of September. The change is essentially in the new sections, big section specifically on consultation, which refers to consultation and equalities issues. Uh, it depends how you read it. It doesn't mean that you have to go along with whatever everybody tells you. And you could also say that the cyclists and pedestrians, local residents, people concerned about climate change and air quality should be the ones who are given uh, special consideration when being consulted. So consultation uh, can cover a lot of things. Uh, there will be more time to be given for implementation, as I mentioned before. Uh, the schemes, some of them, I think, could actually only start after the end of March. So, you know, things I hope don't get kicked down the road. Uh, there's no big surprises on the local authorities getting lower or higher percentages of bids, although it's not clear on the precise reasons for such decisions, such as analysis of mon monitoring, um, because uh, I'm not sure that the monitoring was done uh, in very great detail for tranche one. Uh, the actual uh, pro forma that needed to be filled out didn't wasn't very searching in terms of what LAs had to do in their monitoring. So I'm not sure if, if what they did the tranche one is, is actually the, the reason for the kind of allocations they've had. Um, I, I do think there were a number of local authorities that are uh, not really interested, uh, suggested a scheme that wouldn't make much difference, overbid massively, and so they're not getting much money and they're not going to do much. Um, that's my view. Uh, part six of the Road Traffic Act 2004 needs to be in place as soon as possible. I'd like people to make comments on that. Um, and finally, uh, just to be a little bit depressing, this is all in the context of lots of money for roads building program, and in particular the Stonehenge and Silvertown tunnels. And there is enormous hostility locally to both of those large projects. Uh, so, you know, like Stonehenge, um, Reed Phil Goodwin stuff on that, two billion pounds. Uh, here we're talking about a total of actually what should have been 225 million. It's actually gone down a bit. Um, uh, that's where we are. And I, there are some questions raised from this. This is my last slide. Questions raised some issues and questions. These are my personal things that I'm kind of interested in. So what about schemes like the Shoreham Lanes in West Sussex? Will they have to be reintroduced? Will there be a clawback on money? Um, 
will this affect what they do with phase two? Um, I don't know. And it would be interesting to debate and discuss about that. Uh, the monitoring, which is required as it should be, uh, who's going to be doing that? Will it be Active Travel England? Will they have a, uh, a, a program telling uh, local authorities what to do? Uh, will local authorities just do what they want? Will Active Travel England have to do site visits themselves? Uh, now this making permanent issue, I uh, have raised this right from the beginning. Um, I do hope it's not just a question of saying, oh, well, that looks quite good. We're going to replace the wands and so on with um, very expensive materials. So you won't actually get anything much, uh, much more. It won't be, um, you know, a, a step forward. It could be just some sort of consolidation of something which was there before. Um, so that's a query uh, and I didn't mention the remaining 25 million pounds out of the 250 million pounds which was the bike voucher scheme and I raised that as a question and yesterday the second wave has been announced don't forget there are five waves so the amount of help for people who need uh, that 50 quid for the bringing the bike out of the shed and getting it roadworthy um, uh, that's still taking a very long time to come out, although that is because of strain on bike shops. Um, will there be any direct yeah, support? Yeah, that's now finished. The, all, of, all of the vouchers have now been allocated. Oh, they have all been allocated. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I thought it was just the second wave. My mistake. Um, okay. And... Will there be direct support for cycling type schemes either now or some stage in the future? I don't know. Uh, what happens to schemes which are non-compliant with L1 TN120? Will they be taken out or just not funded or what? What happens to previous schemes put in in uh, previous times? What will happen there? Uh, what happens to the LAs with low allocations who aren't really interested? Will they be penalized elsewhere in what they do? Um, I would be interested in what happens with road traffic collisions involving cyclists where there is substantial work or work hasn't been done, which was called for. Uh, mentioned part six, RTA 2004. And we need to crack on with stuff like road traffic uh, law and policing and issues like home cycle parking. And that is it. So um, I am, uh, I would really be pleased in what people say about all that. Thanks, Bob. That was great. I think uh, we'll make a note, though, for, for next week, because you sometimes have a little bit of a delay. Maybe you don't bring up the text line by line, because you're in a little bit of a two Ronnies moment with the images not quite matching what you were saying. That's a very All annoying, right. isn't it? But I got that. I got that. Cheers, mate. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's well, yeah, Mark, so yeah, I just want to bring in Mark first, and then we'll have some like points of order and stuff, but... Mark, we definitely want to hear your steer on this. Yeah, so two I'll things. Let you, know you say anything too bold. No, I won't say anything too bold. So first of all, the first thing to say is that there's the letter from Grant Shapps, but the other, the more influential um, piece is this, is the Traffic Management Act uh, statutory guidance, network management guidance. And um, you're not allowed to put things out in PDFs anymore, but I PDF'd it and went through the document. I was... Um, part of a group that got the draft and saw the draft and there's some been, been some changes to that. Um, this was put out in May and this is the replacement for that in May and this is statutory guidance to local authorities. Uh, anything in yellow has changed since May. Um, I'll put this up, I can't remember if I put it up somewhere but I'll circulate it round. Um, so the various changes to the guidance to local authorities, one is that LTN 120 which didn't exist in May has been included um, as I discussed with Phil, they've changed the examples of junction design that, that they're recommending to councils. 
It was in May it said put in ASLs, now it says do proper things. Um, they have indeed reduced the, um, the priority given to widen footways. So they've essentially said you don't need to do things about footways anymore. Uh, they kept uh, the opportunity to use experimental orders and they've, I'll scroll through right to this, they've got a whole new page on engagement. So everything in yellow in, on that page wasn't, uh, wasn't put out to the councils in, in May. So all of that is new. I won't go through it in detail. Um, there's a lot to read there, but the key point to say in there is that the original uh, draft that went to council or went out to a group of consultees, including CIHT, where I consulted, said um, it says in here about councils, businesses. Um, by the way, businesses who are closed should be informed. I'm not quite sure how you inform closed businesses, but anyway, the original uh, document said businesses should be the op given the opportunity to comment or object. And it was assumed by the DFT that businesses would only want to object. It now just says businesses should be given the, the opportunity to comment to ensure proposals meet their needs, which is a lot more neutral and less biased. So that's that's a good change. There is a lot there on, on consultation and engagement and local disability groups, and also about using the public sector equality duty and referring to all protected characteristics. So it's not just disability, it's age and gender and race religion as well so all those need to be taken into account so that's that's one thing but what i'll do is very quickly talk about active travel fund i was a bit late later up like like um bob i'm looking at the results now i got to the point where i was asking how much uh, atf funding did georgia get so i seem to be confusing my staying up late things um but what i did is an analyze it rogers put a thing out about Cycling UK and I thought that was all right but I thought it was easier to look at it on a map of where the boundaries were. So I've gone through, so this is what councils have got in phase two, the darker green have got more money and a certain group of councils have got over 25 percent. Can you see it? No. Oh, it, says your, it says your screen sharing is paused. Resume share. Can you see it now? I don't know why it's paused. I've not paused it, no, it should be on. Okay, I'll try it again. Right. How's that? Can you see it now? Wait for it. Yes. There you go. Right, so the one on the left is for, is phase two. Darker green in, in, is, um, they got more money. The DFT, so the way to remember it is the DFT, there's an indicative allocation and then there's the actual allocation. And I'll come back to the indicative allocation in a minute because I found out where it's come from. Um, but. What happened is they started off with indicative allocation and then put councils into one of five bands. Councils that got 25% more, councils that got 100% of what their indicative allocation was, 95%, 75%, and 60%. About So seven councils got 25% more, or councils, uh, authorities, so that includes TFGM, for example, who got 3 million more than they'd been indicatively allocated, which is more, the next biggest was Suffolk, which got 300 grand more. So it's 10 times bigger. So Manchester got almost as much as London, basically. So kudos to Manchester. Um, not 100% included Brighton and Hove and so on. 95%, I'm not sure what the point of giving councils 95% of their allocation was, because in some cases it was like five grand less than they would have got. I think it's just a very, very mild tap on the wrist to say, hey, you haven't been absolutely perfect, but you go on. Then there's the 75%, which includes West Sussex. And then there's the 60%. There are six councils who got 60%. Worcestershire obviously being one of them, a whole little cluster in Berkshire and Thurrock. Um, oh, and Torbay, I think, down at the end. So when you add that up and you balance it on phase one, you've got this balanced one. So some councils did really badly the first time around and, and picked themselves up. As you said, I think Adam said, was it Adam said, uh, oh, the, oh shit, we better do something about this. So um, Essex, for example, was one of them. It got very low in the first round, but then picked up. Uh, I think Worcestershire was the only one that did badly both times round. So there you go. So that's, I, I'll be putting these up on the TI website very soon if we can work out how to do it. Um, it's slightly confused by the way that some are, some of them are not councils. So Northeast is the North, Northeast Joint Transport Committee, which is Tyne and Weir, Northumberland and County Durham. So it's not an entity that exists and it doesn't, and it existed at a point and it doesn't actually exist anymore, even as a combined authority. So for them to get the money is slightly confusing. 
Cambridge is Cambridge and Peterborough and so on. So there are odd, there are odd authorities that get the money, um, not councils. These are the councils that got 100%. And this is my point about Greater Manchester. The bar is longer than all the others put together. Um, and these are the ones that got slightly more. This is a, more or less what uh, Bob was showing earlier. So these are the ones that got over both phases, more than 100% of their indicative amount. These are the ones that got less than 80%. It neatly fitted in. So West Sussex is in the um, down to Worcestershire at the bottom that got 58% of the amount. So they could have got another 40% more money to spend on things that they weren't, that they didn't successfully claim. Um, Portsmouth is quite interesting because I thought they were doing quite well, but I'm not sure why they did so badly. And there are others in there. This is the fix. So this is the, um, uh, yeah, that's the final slide. This is the one that Bob's shared. Now, it's nothing, this is nothing to do, the indicative amount is nothing to do with how good or bad the councils were, or at least they started off with. They had the ability to, to do better or worse. This is based on the amount of journeys that were taken by public transport. And if you go back to the census data, this, it, it's the combined, it's proportional directly to the amount of journeys that were taken by bus or rail or tube or metro in 2011 when the census was taken. And it's 91 pounds per trip taken reported in the census by people traveling in 2011. Um, and, that's, and that's how the figure's been worked out. Now, somebody at the DFT would have to tell me why it's 91 pounds, presumably they started with the total and then divided it. So if your council had a lot of commuters by rail going to London, such as Reading or Brighton, your council started off with a base indicative allocation of a lot of money. And if your council, like Herefordshire, which is on there, had very low public transport, then you're got, you got less money. The whole indication for this was basically what has happened is that lots of people would start driving. So if you already had lots of people driving, then you didn't need as much money. Whereas if you already had lots of people who weren't driving, you needed to get more money to try and persuade those people not to drive. That was the original thinking behind the whole EATF back in May. It's taken so long to get to this point that people have forgotten about it. And the, the link between that allocation in May and the actual what's happened now is probably completely far too late to actually make any difference to it. But that is where the thinking is. This 91 pound, it's 90 pounds 88 to 91 pound 20. It's obviously been rounded up. But that is the figure. So, of course, if you had lots of people traveling by public transport in 2011 and then suddenly got lots of people driving, you still got more money. If you didn't have many people using public transport and have done really, really well in the last 10 years, you would get less money. So you've got to remember it's a 10 year. The, the funding allocation is based on an almost 10 years out of date formula. But it's the only formula that we've got. And that's presumably why the DFT used it. So there you go. That's that's my very quick analysis. And I'll, I'll try and I'll put all these up for people to use. Thanks. Well, wow, that was really good, Mark. We've got our own John Snow now, haven't we? Uh, oh, I've got a sorry. Do I have to do all this? I oh, know that's Peter Snow, isn't it? That waved yeah. his hands around. <laughs> You're going to get to see Peter Snow. Yeah, John Snow. I need a swingometer. <laughs> yeah, now you, you think I know my snows. All right. Um, can I make some comments about stuff? in the um in the uh uh chat um first of all there's been stuff about how roger is uh pushing forward uh the section six uh, sorry part six to our four act he may want to say something i'm getting a lot of stuff about how school streets are kind of disappearing uh they're not being pushed um please if anybody wants the slides i'm sorry about the delay do email me on chairrdrf at aol.com uh, or put your name down on the chat and I will send you the presentation. Um, and uh, b -b 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 yeah, Bob, can I just come in then? Because uh, like, j just Roger, do you want to say what you said in the chat? Because it was quite a key moment for our, for our YouTubers. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, well, there was a there was. I, I'm sorry, I had to drop out of the call, so I'm, I may have missed some of, some of what what's been passing here. Um, there was a um, 
The background to this is the Traffic Management Act 2004. Yes, 2004 is what contains the legislation that, uh, that local authorities outside London need to be able to enforce school street schemes and a bunch of other things such as yellow box, junk, yellow box junctions. Um, we and many other organisations, including all the local authority organisations, the, the, um, uh, uh, the local government association and so on, have been pressing for this for a very long time. And the government's been making all sorts of excuses for a very long time as to why they weren't going to give local authorities these powers. Um, then all of a sudden, out of the blue, I, I asked um, Lloyd Russell Moyle, the MP for Brighton, Kemp Town, I think he might be Mark's MP, if I'm not mistaken, um, to, table a, uh, to table a written question in the summer, where he asked Grant Shapps, Transport Secretary, um, so, um, you know, school streets are great, but when will the Secretary of State, uh, will, the state will the Secretary of State bring in the legislation that allows the local authorities to enforce them? And Grant Shapps got up and just said, I will. And everyone went, wow! <laughs> so his, Lloyd Russell Moyle's researcher sort of immediately went and said, so when? And uh, at that point, the Department of Transport written answer was, uh, oh, one day. And um, just last week, Chris Grayling asked whether it would be, yes, Chris Grayling asked whether it is the department's policy to encourage school street schemes. And the department's answer said, yes, it is. I thought, well, this is an opportunity to ask another parliamentary question about, so when are you going to introduce that part? Part six legislation. So Russ, uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle's researcher has tabled that question earlier this afternoon, and it should get answered on November the 23rd. Um, all being well. Awesome. Cheers, Roger. Glad you're taking care of us all. I just say that Lloyd's researcher is my friend, si oh, I probably shouldn't say this, it's my friend Simon, who used to be the leader of the council, and is a friend of mine in Chris Todd's, and, uh, and recently did Lee Jog as well in the summer. So he He's definitely, so it's definitely one of us. Everybody's a friend of yours, Mark, aren't they? Um, speaking of another one, Lucy, did you want to come in with a comment? Yeah, Question? I just, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of make a comment about this uh, new, the kind of new guidance on equality, which I think is, uh, you know, engagement and uh, a kind of renewed uh, emphasis on including people like disabled groups and so on. Mark is right that it does say, you know, consider all, all the people who've got protected characteristics under the Equality Act, but the emphasis is still really not on, not on children, not on, you know, pregnant women, not on all these groups actually that make up a very large proportion of the population. Um, and I think that is something that needs addressing. You know, there's mention of guide dogs for the blind, RNIB, RNIB visionary groups, um, Royal Mail, all these other groups, but not, for example, nurseries, primary schools, really, you know, large sections of the population that cannot get around. And I think that's that does need changing. Um, and, and it ties into that issue of school streets. Yeah, I, I think that's it. Rant over. Completed here. I think we're all totally echo that point, Lucy. Um, well, so has anybody got any other points for us or questions for this one before we get into bus stops? No, right, good. Um, I'm just going to put something in the chat now. I just wanted to point out the um, the document that's just come out from uh, uh, Local Transport Today and Landor on all the uh, specifications stuff. I kind of cheekily announced it as a, here's what we spend the money on, but there's some really good like uh, um, products in there. And I also know they've got lots of printed copies as well. So I'm sticking um, Daniel's email in the chat with the link to the document. Well worth having a peruse through. Good one to get to you. The councillors go. It looks like that. <laughs> anyway, so I'll do that, and now I'll um I'll jump just into just a quickie. Just go before on, we then, jump on. in, um, uh, Rachel Lee is talking about how uh that we've still got time for the pavement parking consultation. So don't forget that. All right, enough of you now. Let let me take over. <laughs> <laughs> After have to you something about, no, go on, Bob, go on, I'll let you get another word in. No, I'm, I'm only joking. We're over 100, Bob, 105, 105. Come on. That's exciting. Let me uh, share the screen. Um, right. Wait for it. Got to my, some too many slides first. All right. I, I thought I'd like tackle this kind of uh, most emotive of subjects that Certainly, uh, seems to be the last five years, everywhere I go, there's a nice, fresh argument developing on 
on uh, the bus stop bypasses or it's completely insane relative to the shared bus border also known as the shared use bus border by some people so the SBs and subs or SBBs so really I wanted to just talk through the evidence now it's a tricky one going through the evidence on this stuff because not a lot of it's like um publicly available I kind of know of uh, lots of it because I work with local authorities who commission it and there's a whole bunch of evidence that that local authorities put together when they're making the case for new infrastructure that never quite sees the light of day. It's a bit annoying. So I thought I'd share some um, observations on those as well, still being a little bit neutral. But anyway, so there's a mixture of like a published empirical data fact, and then there's stuff that is a fact and we have tested it, but I'm not gonna tell you the source. That's the way it is. Anyway, I thought like it's worth talking about like uh, the data of uh, of why we're doing these things. Uh, I was going through my archive of uh, of how you take cycle lanes past bus stops, and uh, and I particularly like this example, which I won't name where it is. I bet Mark Strong knows, but I won't get him to say. I mean, it's it's kind of from back in the day when it was fresh, and it's that kind of classic what we used to call dual provision, which I still he hear people talk about. Well. This is for the confidence cyclists, and this is where and the other kids go. And you're like, well, nobody's gonna like any of this. These are the kind of painful compromises that so okay, our confidence cyclist just veers it out into the carriageway. And if there's a bus there, well, they're stuffed, and they have to go right into the running lane, or just go through or the wait in the exhaust. And oh, there's a there's a confident person's thing. If a confidence person probably wouldn't even need that. Anyway, you've got that one. Or the op other option that most people press is to kind of just share it around the bus stop and then start the segregation again at the other side. That's what we've got. And we've got we've got thousands of these things around the UK. Now, um, when I was working with Andrew Gilligan and in Boris's second term, and we're really looking at ways, actually it was a little bit of a first term one as well. Um, we're really looking at ways of avoiding shared use and particularly in light of gear change and what it says in the latest documents like it, it couldn't be any clearer to avoid this sort of stuff so we we have to acknowledge that all bus stop bypasses and uh and shared bus borders came about because we're trying to avoid shared use i like it like i remember saying this to a visually impaired group has gone the whole reason i did this to, was to avoid all the thing that you've been fighting against and we're going Oh yeah, and I go, well, how do I make this thing that avoids this overall massive issue, how do I make that work best for you? And it's worth worth bearing that in mind. I know I'm getting into conjecture now when I said I just do evidence, but we've got to, we've got to introduce the topic. So there's, there's the classic, classic British way of dealing with cycle lanes past bus stop, just like, who knows, mm, sharing it or wiggle it around it. Um, and also, like, uh, let's start getting into the evidence now. Like, uh, here's from some of the, the like, uh, visuals that TFL put together all those years ago when they were kind of pushing this as a new thing, even though there were examples in the UK going back 20, 30 years that we can find. But I've referenced the, the documents that I've used down the bottom as well. I thought I'd uh, get a... Uh, go through this. So in the, in the near miss report, the Rachel Aldred one's like brilliant because it kind of fills in all the gaps between the collisions because luckily collisions are rare. So they're quite difficult to study. You're looking over long periods of time. But anyway, one of the things, the third most common type of, of near miss is the vehicle pulling in or out. Very closely associated with bus movements on there. So, uh, and buses are particularly referenced in, in that document, in that statement as well. Uh, let's read a few more other things. 73% of collisions involving cyclists and buses um, are reduced by bus stop bypasses. They're the, like the going straight ahead one, the overtaking, the kind of moving off. So uh, like uh, when it comes to buses, we don't have a huge amount of hook collisions, but there's lots that come about when there's like a, when like a pinching or a narrowing, that collision from alongside, um, that pulling into the bus stop thing. Uh, lots of the actual collisions involving with Buses and cyclists occur in those scenarios. And if we've got like a bus stop bypass or some description like that, then we avoid that. It reduces the risk of it. So there's a, a very real strong need there. Quite interestingly, like 60% of cycling fatalities, uh, it's like a bit of an old report, this one, but it's worth mentioning, involve large vehicles compared with 40% across the, uh, the rest of Great Britain. 
It's an interesting start. So we really like had to focus it and like, hence there's a huge movement and to look at HTV and cycling safety in London. We still have those issues outside of the UK, but it's something stronger. Maybe it's like a, maybe it's the amount of buses. Maybe it's the sheer amount of construction work that's going on there, but there's a, it's certainly a lot higher. Um, yeah, 50% of the fatalities, and this is over a short period. It was like a, a reference to fatality report. The buses are actually driving over the cyclists. So what's going on? It's all again about that kind of sharing of space and that kind of moving in across. So we're, we have to look at that. But like we, we've got to remember, it's only 3% of uh, killed serious injuries type collisions that actually involve buses. Or be that's a higher proportion than the actual composition of traffic on our streets involving buses. So there's, um, they're still overrepresented, but you still got to put it into factor. It's still the cars, lest we forget. But there's, uh, there's still an issue to think about here. Um, so like, can, can, I, can I give you another statistic, by the way? Wonder, which is, you've forgotten, you haven't accounted for injuries to bus passengers. I can't, it's on my phone and I can't transfer it. For 50 oh, 57% of uh, people who are injured on buses are slips and falls. And of that, this was a, 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 a survey by the National Public Service Vehicle Accident Survey. Um, and basically 45% of injuries on buses took place as passengers were getting up and a third happened when they fell over when they were step, stepping down. And basically, it, so if a bus does an emergency stop, people fall over. And that all those injuries to people on, on buses outweigh the injuries between cyclists and buses or pedestrians and buses. It's a it's a huge accident problem, crash sorry crash problem, and um, a lot of that is caused by emergency stops. So if a bus driver has to swerve to avoid somebody cycling out in front of them, then that's going to cause a problem for people on the buses. I think that is a beauty, uh, Mark. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, and just just my next note there is when it comes to the the bus stop bypasses and the and the shared bus borders, we've got hundreds of these things out there uh, now, but there's no real collisions to study. That's why we kind of look at interaction analysis, which we'll get through in the next slide, and, and I've talked about previously. But like, luckily, there aren't any collisions to study, so it's very difficult to use this kind of same methodology. What we can study is the actual collisions that take place between buses and cyclists when they're not protected, of which you know there are there are far too many, and lots of that's reduced by the bypasses. Anyway, so that's the kind of safety case that there are actual collisions. If we do these things, then those type of collisions are greatly reduced or disappear around the bus stops. That's a that's a fundamental thing that we've always got to acknowledge and have a I've always not wanted to trade that for like a, a kind of feeling or perception of safety issue. We'll come we'll back to that one in there. It's only a few slides, but we're going to go right into it and I hopefully like uh, steer off a bit of a discussion. So how are bus stop bypasses performing? Like uh, most of this stuff's out there, but there's a few things that aren't, but I want to mention it anyway. So interactions, what do we mean by an interaction? Well, because we're not studying collisions here, because it's incredibly rare, for a cyclist to injure a pedestrian or pedestrian to injure a cyclist at a bus stop bypass. We look at, we look at video footage and we look at the levels of interaction. So Transport Research uh, Laboratory came up with this process. I think we had Marcus on talking about it a while ago. So basically like a five point scale of like a completely anticipated to the kind of the miss, the very near miss, right away up to like a level five, someone's hit someone else. And that's still highly unlikely to result in someone being hospitalized or for it to even be recorded ever as like a, an actual road traffic accident. But, you know, we can look at the evidence of God. There's lots of people actually running into each other. We might expect some kind of collision to take place. So anyway, when we looked at this, and this is from like a TFL's like a published reports, so that 96% of the in interactions at bus stop bypasses are low level. They might go, well, that's pretty good. But when it comes to safety, you go, oh, what about those other 4%? Like uh, that could be people running into each other. So we'll get, get into that. Interestingly, like um, I, I know this was on the specific bus stop in question there that I've shown a picture of. Um, despite like narrowing the cycle track, dinking it in horizontal deflection, then vertical deflection. And sometimes with uh, zebras, there's, uh, there's no change in cycling speed. So, I mean, if you're a traffic engineer, you go, yes, great. No change in cycling speed, but that's, that's a, a pretty poor indictment in general because we'd 
quite like cyclists to slow down in the vicinity of uh, bus stop bypasses, but the evidence says that they don't and they're not, and they're kind of taking the priority through there. A um, few things with uh, zebra perception of safety. So once we put the zebras in there, the perception of safety gets better, increases for, for like uh, people with different disabilities from 58% to 68% approval. So there's like uh, people feel safer if you put a zebra there. It's still not 100% safe though, is it? We'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, um, when we did the initial research, like a uh, vision impaired groups were saying they can't locate where the bus stop is. So if you do do a zebra, and it gives you an opportunity to put in a L-shaped tactile, so if they're walking along, the tapping along the building line, they can feel a, the tactile and go, actually, yes, I remember now, this is where the bus stop is, and then get across there. So there's a real win with doing zebras and L-shaped tactiles. That's what's come out, that's what we know. 40% of cyclists give way to them. Like a, say it quick, doesn't seem so bad. But for me, that's the kind of like a, kind of damning stats somewhat and a, and a real worry like a you know like it it's one of those things some roads like cars have complete priority that's like on most roads in the uk and pedestrians just have to watch out and get across there and the same thing seems to be happening here with cyclists that they're taking priority so pedestrians kind of realizing that and they're going across and and 40 percent even if the zebra's there only 40% are actually slowing down and, and giving way. And I know we had a few issues in Manchester on the on the, the news up there of like uh, people with canes standing like and the zebra, like with the, the canes in there and cyclists who were passing. It's, uh, it, it looks bad and it is bad. And we have to do something about it. The fact that people aren't giving way, even if there's like a formal indication to do so. That's what the evidence is saying is that there is this issue. So what are we going to do about it? That's what... That's what I take on. It's still an issue all in the realms of like uh, annoyance and, and vexation. It's not in the uh, in the road traffic accidents, but it is an issue and we've got to look at it. Um, some like a more survey style stuff. So the ease of access for passengers, like 68%, 68% of passengers said it was very easy. I'm not gonna say the source on this one, but 8% found it very hard. And like, if we're going to be inclusive, and we've already talked about the Equality Act now, we have to think about why is it very hard, those 8%, is there anything we can do about it? Or be, you know, from a, a higher engineering perspective, we go, yeah, dealt with, that's pretty good. It's over, it's over 50, we're doing all right. It's all a little bit of a messy business engineering, but still, you know, we have to take that seriously. Um, on one of the surveys I've seen, 8% of people said they had seen accidents one of the sites that they were questioned about so that's eight percent like you know one in ten people had seen some kind of collision so that level five interaction so even though when we're examining it none of the research has shown any kind of interactions of that level and of the extensive research people when you talk to them have said have you seen people run into each other and go yeah i've seen an accident and it's hard to then unpick as it was just someone went past you and did they classify that as an accident it's not going to be recorded in to, into the data but it's still like a no, that's that's a very high percentage that I've seen an accident related to uh, to cyclists and pedestrians at these things, even if we can't find any evidence of it. And I mean, I talk about the ones that we did in Camden back in the day. There was ones that we had in place for ten years and never had a complaint to the council, never had a recorded collision. Doesn't mean that people aren't running into each other. It's like uh, I could mention Wellington Street as well. Now that Westminster have uh, sorted it out there off Waterloo Bridge, you, you'd stand there for 10 minutes and you will see a cyclist riding to a pedestrian or a pedestrian step into it. No collisions ever recorded, but that's ruining people's days. So we, we have to think of that side of things. So performance-wise, it's pretty good. If it was to do this kind of analysis on the, like uh, most of the main roads we've got with traffic, you're in a much more serious situation. Um, but anyway, like uh, there's still like a cause for concern. So what do we do about it? And I've talked about this before and I'll just mention it. I think um, one of the things you can do is like, what can we do to stop cyclists? Is there some kind of marking? Do we put the giveaways in there? Like some people are doing like uh, uh, flashing lights, like uh, warning signs, all those sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, one of the things that like we potentially could do is just warn pedestrians particularly visually impaired pedestrians as to whether cyclists were approaching or not because one of the issues they have is you just don't know they don't know if they're coming and then they don't know if they'll stop 
So that's a real like they can't hear them coming if you're standing there as a visually impaired person in there. So when do you step, even if there's a zebra there, you might feel slightly safer, but it's still of that eight percent of the people that gone. This is still very hard. I don't know if I'm stepping out where I'm going to get run into, given that only 40% are giving way to it. These are these are not good uh, stats to share. But if we can do some kind of audible warning as to whether cyclists are approaching or not that might ease them and actually like it improve the perception of safety there and, and encourage them to use the stops. So that's that's something that I'm hoping we're going to research. Uh, it probably would have already been concluded if we hadn't had like the uh, the uh, global crisis. But, you know, these are the sort of things we can look at. So for me as an engineer, we get a kind of issue like this. I go, well, we need to test this then. I don't want to throw the baby out with a bathwater, which a lot of people are saying, don't do these things, they're horrifically dangerous. And go, no, going around the bus on your bike or the bus swinging across you, that's that's people's lives. That's actual fat fatalities that we studied. This, there's got to be engineering solutions that we can do. And I think this uh, um, might help in that regard. So I'm not just showing the issues, I'm showing things that we could potentially do about it to, to further the research and keep these things in place. Okay. Shared bus borders, as I call them. <laughs> Here's one in Enfield. I particularly like this design because it doesn't kind of infer like a, a cycling priority across there. It's, it's really like a pedestrian one, but I'm not talking about design today. I'm talking about the uh, the evidence. Everybody wants to get into like specific design issues, but I'm just saying, how are these performing? Bearing in mind that people are going to get details wrong. They're going to put like a, a shelters in the middle of where the cyclists are riding. There's going to be bins placed in the wrong place and people are going to be gathering the stuff you don't foresee. But anyway, how are they actually performing? So the, there's at least 70 of these in London alone. I was definitely involved in the first few that came along. And there's a lot more, particularly on the Mini Hollands project. They're, they're in LTN 120, lest we forget, as like a standard approach. Um, <coughs> But like uh, there is still this perception that they're a horrifically unsafe thing to do and that how can bus passengers be expected to just step out into the path of speeding cyclists? Well, let, let's unpack whether that actually is the case. So in, in the case of like um, shared bus borders, 100% of the interactions for every bit of analysis done have been low or moderate. Now, this stuff, uh, again, the sources aren't revealed here, but I looked at the evidence myself and, and went through the videos and spoke to the survey companies. And I won't say where we're at, but it has been studied. But you're talking 100% low level. So it was, it was like, what was it, 96% on the or stop by price? So we're talking 100. No one's ever recorded a high level interaction. There was a, there was one site, I will say. Um, yeah, where, where was it now? I think it was Waltham Forest. And um, when there was a kind of spike of like high level ones and I got the, the video stuff out and I was looking for it, I was going, what is it? It was basically the same lad at the same time he was on the way from school, just jumping out on cyclists uh, from behind a bus stop in there. That was the highest level interaction we've ever had recorded. Um, so anyway, that, and also like interestingly, the highest level interactions, albeit they were all low, <laughs> but the higher ones were associated with, uh, with bus passengers waiting hence the, the kid jumping out on the cyclist and that sort of thing. But people kind of uh, waiting around. It wasn't from bus passengers getting on and off. And you, we've kind of seen this. I've seen this with my own eyes, really. Like, uh, and, and I might show some videos as well. I really, no, I won't, because I'll tell you where it is. Okay. But yeah, like, uh, um, yeah, what, what we're talking about, yeah, people getting on or off. Like, what, if a cyclist comes along, you can see a bloody great big bus pull into the side. And it's like, well, I'm expecting someone to come off there. So I probably won't go through at my same speed and get hit. That's a, the risk to the person. So we've got the evidence for that, that there's much slower speeds. It's like a 30% drop in the speeds compared to a bus stop bypass. So everybody's slowing down. And and really this kind of like a, the heart, the interactions are, I'm, I'm gonna quote something from, that you might never see, but typically harmonious, slowing down or stopping and I've got videos that I show to people. If there's any local authority people who are actually planning on doing this stuff, happy to help. I'll show you what we'll have. But I'm not prepared to like publish it now. Um, but like, yeah, cyclists do one or two things when there's a bus present. They had a slow right down and kind of wiggle through, in which case you go, oh, come on, you should have stopped. But it's very safe, if not a little bit annoying. And you go, oh, what's that cyclist doing there? It's that kind of interaction. Or they stop. And there's a video have when you see cyclists stop and the next one stops and everybody stops and go, wow, ah, we're timing that badly today. There's a bus stop there. There's a bus in there. So it actually um, works pretty well. But there's still that massive perception issue 
that it's just fundamentally unsafe. And we had like a, like a Mary Cray on the other week and she said, all oh, these crazy ones that they do. And, and that our, our dear friend of Ideas with Beers, Nigel Farage, was going on about the, the London ones where the cyclist just runs straight through the bus stop passengers and it's got, oh my God, they can't really... Oh. to where the cyclists are going through there. Am I breaking up a bit? Yeah, we lost you there for a second, Brian. All right, yeah, bloody... You're back now. You're okay. All right, thank you. So anyway, I'm kind of wrapping this up a little bit now. Anyway, we're, we're nearly done. Um, so there's still that huge perception. So what can we do? Uh, particularly, again, it comes down to visually impaired people. Like uh, we could say, oh, well, look at the safety records. Great, they would go, I won't touch that bus stop in a million years. What do you do about it? We have to tackle it. And it's been the same thing with cycling growth. If you have that perception of safety issue, you have to tackle it. So um, I might have shown you this one before, but this is something that I was in discussion with uh, Ross Atkin, who's done a lot of work with visually impaired groups. He's gone, well, why don't you do an optional barrier that people can kind of press and it kind of goes down and then they know they're going to get across. It could even be worked off the bus. So the, the ambiguity has gone there entirely. You go, oh, what bad timing today does that? There's a bus stop. I've, I've seen bus bus borders where like a, a normally the best situation is a bus comes in, lots of people get on and off the bus and there's no ambiguity just as a cyclist go, well, I better wait. But like if you if you want people to feel safe, maybe there's something we can press like a, in this case, like a, a drop barrier. So if you have that real issue when it's going to affect and you haven't got the space and you don't want to just uh, throw a cyclist around the back, you go, well, actually work with your local groups and say, okay, well, there is something we could do. Maybe someone can test this kind of thing out. We're, we were looking at doing a little bit of a prototype, but again, it completely addresses that that perception. I know everybody go, oh, cyclists getting hit on the head and they're all maniacs, but we've got the evidence that they're slowing down. Is there something we could do to really improve the perception of the safety? That, that means we don't have to take the facility out. We don't have to just stop in the lane and start it again or go back to the, the kind of silly stuff that I showed in there. In the first one so for me there are engineering solutions and, and we need to test them we need to get evidence for them and see whether it worked or not so all, all around the evidence is looking quite good and supportive of these things but there are still issues that we kind of have to tackle and uh, i'll put this one in there we want to have some like uh, discussions and i'll stop sharing now so we can have a discussion anyway that was like a, a real hop skip and a jump through the evidence of what we have and i hope that's useful um, and we can also, if you're actually ever planning on doing these things, talk to me and I'll, I'll speak to you for hours about it. Don't you worry. Has anybody got any questions? Ryan. Mark, I can see your hand up. Yeah, and if yeah. you want to put your name in the chat, if I forget you, I can't all see it, then, uh, then I'll... Uh... Well, two things. I've been talking about bus stop life versus probably, I don't know, longer, as long as you have actually presented on it at Velo City. And I won't show you my three minute long video of bus stop by versus at which I had for Velo City, but um, the two the two elements that you, you know I mentioned about bus passengers and the other element is bus drivers. And one of the things that I did was interview drivers. Actually, they they insisted that I had the shop steward there in case the drivers incriminated themselves. But one of the things the drivers were saying is their cognitive load. If they're trying to work out whether a cyclist is coming up behind them is going to be on their right, their left, overtaking, undertaking, it causes them great problems. And the figure I had about the somebody said about TFLC bus passenger falls is one of the most serious injury issues. So if the driver has to cope with all of that, at least they don't take fares anymore, but, but they can't work out. So the driver likes, drivers like certainty. They're like knowing that is where the cyclist is going to go. And I don't have to worry about one less thing I have to worry about. And that means that I won't do an emergency stop. So that's a real source of you know, bus drivers. And Tim said he was a conductor as well. Though those people are a real source of thing. And the other piece of evidence we've got from Brighton, and I can't underestimate this, we've had 50, you know, nearly 10 years of 15 floating bus stops in Brighton. And Victoria Garcia is the, as far as we know, the only disabled um, access officer working for a bus company in the country. So, and she's actually been seconded now by the DFT to advise on disability and bus, on public transport. And she is absolutely categoric that A, there is no safety implications. They have got 10 years of video records. There's no safety implications to Brighton Hope bus passengers. Highest level of bus use outside London, remember, um, on that, or 
Um, and B, there is no reduction in disabled use of buses because they know they can't tell which of those passengers are visually impaired because they don't, the driver doesn't do that. But they can tell who's used disabled passes on the buses. And on those routes, the 25 bus route that, that is used on this road, there has been no reduction in disabled use of the buses. So there's no evidence that it scares disabled people off. It could be scaring off visually impaired people and more wheelchairs are using it because the bus stops are better designed. That's a possibility. But, but I, I just think I'm sorry, but, but I think Ross's stuff is all hyped up. And I think the moment you start giving in to him with the barriers and the high tech, it starts giving them an inch. I think, you know, we just need to be robust on this one. And it is behavior change. Well, you've got evidence in your area that means it seems to be OK. But the evidence that I showed from London suggests that there is an issue and it needs to be taken seriously and maybe you, you sound police go oh we all just try and get along maybe there's some kind of nudge behavioral stuff or you get the police out there there's there's different ways of tackling it but there's still there still is that issue the fundamental issue like a, a visually impaired person not knowing if the cyclist is going to stop and evidence that cyclists don't always stop for them that's a that's just empirical fact mark well, they don't know the drivers are going to stop. They don't know the cyclists are going to stop anywhere else. They don't know if a pedestrian is going to stop anywhere else. Mm. Hey, hey. All right, I'll bring in uh, Martin Gibson now and we'll get going. But re really good information to share, Mark. Maybe write up in a little note for everybody if you can get some sources for that stuff. That would be really useful to share. What's he got? Thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I, just quick um, sort of um, question really I suppose um, is is I wonder if this is about um, the sort of partial infrastructure that we've got so there's been a lot of chat in the, the a lot of discussion in the chat about the difference between the UK and the Netherlands and and how cyclists respond uh, and I think um, my observation is that cyclists here often cycle faster just because you're you're in fear of your life so much of the time so you cycle faster to keep up the traffic get away from traffic get off the road as quickly as possible and how much of this is about this being sort of endemic and that we end up with a fast cycling culture and the only the only way we'll reverse that is by actually getting there with the infrastructure having more complete infrastructure and and more of a, a slow cycling culture um starting to come in and is it just sort of growing pains and just a sort of stage that we we have to go through with this and does that also maybe explain the the so London Brighton difference, and that yeah, uh, that, 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 yeah. that, that Lon London London's much more affected by that fast cyclist thing. Well, well yeah, it's interesting. When I, I remember when we were selling the super highways, the kind of good ones, <laughs> I was kind of saying once you protect people, kind of can chill out a little bit, and we'll get a bit more people in behaviour. And the, and the speeds did drop dramatically compared to if you mix through cars and you you always frosty on edge and looking for for a way through. And it did drop, but it's still like um, there's still at enough speed. And it, like from a pedestrian perspective, you're going past at like five six miles an hour. That's that's faster than you would go, and that's still a <gasps> moment for people. So there's there's still that perception from people, and and, and it still doesn't address that issue. Even if you're going pootling along with the wind in your hair, a visually impaired person still doesn't know whether you're going to stop for them or whether you're coming. So there is still this like a but no matter which they kind of get with cars crossing roads as well. Don't get me wrong, but it seems to like a the kind of pinpoint of the argument seems to have focused on bus stop bypasses, and as a as a, all those. All those of us pushing active travel want to be nice people and go well we're, we're, we're kind of taking it seriously somewhat so speeds has have dropped and speeds do drop when you put in segregation that that's a kind of proved point and um, so people are kind of getting there but it's still there's still a perception that it's it's different uh, I, I remember talking about this on paths as well if like a, you can approach at whatever speed you want but it's that speed you go past people and unless you're doing that practically walking speed they're going to jump out of their skin just like if you're on a bike and a car goes past it might be only doing five or six miles an hour faster but it's like oh, jesus he's going in a, he's in a different bubble than i'm in and we're in a different bubble to the pedestrian so so i, I get your point uh, but like saying it'll all work its way out in the wash that <laughs> and, which is an argument that we've kind of used but but like and it's a very engineering argument we go let it settle in just let us do more there'll be a point when everybody's nice but like uh we have to like um find little solutions on the way there because they're not Fine. as slow as people would want yep 
Hi. Yeah, just on that, there's there are some interesting studies on the speeds that not only the people cycle, but also that they walk. And we know that they walk a bit more quickly in cities as well. But I think the issue with cycling is partly the demographic because you just don't have that mix of people. So you don't have older people, you don't have children. And maybe on those protected routes, you have actually get a more diverse range of people. So the speeds are brought down as, as well as people feeling more relaxed generally. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. Well, one of the things Robin looked at was whether the bus shelter is glazed or not. And we spent a lot of money on making sure that no ads were on any of the bus shelters. So there was nothing to obstruct the cyclist. Which yeah, obviously yeah. doesn't matter to visually impaired people, but it does to everyone I'll bring, else. I'll bring Roger in. Dave, honestly, I did set this week up for you, knowing that your, your mic was working, but without it, I'll, I'll, I'll let Roger come in. Yeah, yeah, thank, thanks, Brian. Um, I'm, I'm obviously sim very sympathetic to the point of view. Let's let's see what we can do with behaviour change. Um, but I'm also, you know, I'm trying to navigate between these two perspectives. What do we need to do? Because because behaviour change might not work. You know, there's, we've behaviour change has, is not. We've always argued that behaviour change isn't sufficient to deal with the offending, the irresponsible minority of drivers. Why should it be sufficient to deal with the irresponsible minority of, of, of cyclists? We can't have it both ways, as it were. Um, I do think we need to. The point about London and non-London, I suspect, is much more about uh, human behaviour when we're in crowded conditions. The more the more we're stuck in crowded conditions, the more we behave like rats in a sack. And I think that's probably more likely to be the explanation for any difference in behaviour between London and, and Brighton or other places. That we just, you know, even if we were the same people, as soon as we're in something more crowded, we just behave worse. And I think that is actually right down to the macro level, to the micro level of what happens at a really crowded bus stop. I think, you know, um, I've seen, I've been, you know, had dialogues with the National Federation Blind, uh, Blind UK, where they've shown video footage of the uh, bus stop bypass right outside St. Thomas's Hospital at the, um, I was going to say Southern, on the south bank of the Thames, uh, of the Thames of, uh, on Westminster Bridge. That is a bus stop that is also not only heavily used by tourist buses as well as, as it were regular buses, and it's also directly outside a, a hospital where a lot of the people using the buses have just come out from a traumatic experience, just got some bad health news, whatever. So there are all sorts of pedestrians wandering around on what's actually quite a narrow bus stop bypass and some really quite high flows of cyclists. So it's really quite crowded from both perspectives. And I think both groups behave badly there. <laughs> it's, it's quite a problematic bus stop bypass. Um, so I think we, we may need to just have a, a bit of an understanding of, of how conditions can vary from place to place. I think it really would be interesting to understand why is, why is Brighton different. If we are going to have to go to engineering solutions such as barriers or lights or whatever, we need to make sure that they don't end up having to be applied on every single bus stop bypasses, because otherwise bus stop bypasses are going to be, end up becoming incredibly expensive. And so oh, it's, 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 it's going to need to be very clear about when it can be used. We don't get one. One last point is, if to the extent that we can do it through behaviour change, I'd like to see the the the, um, the new highway code as an opportunity to do this. Once the new highway code comes in, fingers crossed, with all of the rules about uh, drivers giving way to pedestrians when turning at junctions and cyclists having to do exactly the same we are going to need to make sure that the cycling community really gets the message that you know what's what's good for us is good for the you know the boots on the other foot when it comes to turning across the paths of pedestrians and so that the me message to the cyclist has to go out that we've got to we've got to take some responsibility for our own community uh, and and some of that can be around our behavior but you know the cycling community's behavior at bus stop bypasses let's see how far we can go with behavior change but you know while at the same time understanding why is it that some bus stop bypasses are different so that we've got an answer to it. if we really are pushed into the engineering route where do we where do where do we really need really really need to adopt it yeah i mean from my point of view having an engineering solution to like a what could be like a four-year legal battle holding up your scheme or uh, well, we need some buttons to press but i'm going to bring in ruth now for the last word unless she asked me a question then i'll have the last word but i'll bring in ruth Okay, very quickly, the whole thing about behaviour change, yes, okay, but an example in Chiswick outside Gunnersbury Station is it's a massive crossing and pre-COVID the business park had 10,000 people working there. 
we could not get a bigger crossing because that would impede traffic and traffic motor traffic because there's no cycle in there. The biggest problem we have, I think, is that there isn't enough space. So we're all concerned about suddenly people getting on and off buses because of cycling, but we've not even allowed people who walk to have the right amount of space anyway on our pavements, anyway at bus stops, anyway when they're crossing roads. So it's a bit rich for this kind of, well, we can't do that because some cyclists might cycle into someone walking across when we haven't even considered dual carriageway type roads in the middle of shopping centres where drivers are doing 2025 and we haven't even considered that so you know bus stop borders I think it will work I do think people do start to stop we can already see it in Chiswick we've got people of all ages now cycling even though the cycle lane isn't finished you know old young middle whatever and over time we will slow down the others who don't want to be slowed or they'll go somewhere else that's what I'd like to say perfect last words let's wrap it up there that's that's the way to finish it Ruth bang on all right everybody see you next week for more hot topics Cheerio.